30% of the world's population is currently food insecure. As the economic impacts of, the, of COVID play out over coming months um, and years, I have no doubt that those figures sadly are likely to get worse. At the same time, we, uh, we've also had a recent report from the IPCC, uh, which has just issued its most dire warning about the threat posed by our rapidly changing climate. Uh, and, and I know speaking to uh, colleagues, many of whom are in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, how, how, uh, how worried you all must be feeling about that. You know, from the deadly floods that you've had, um, both in Europe and Asia, historic water shortages and really catastrophic wildfires, similar to those that we experienced in Australia only two years ago. This year has once again highlighted to us the increasing severity of this global uh, climate change and the rapidity with, with which uh, it's impacting on all systems of our planet, including our food systems. The report, in fact, specifically points to the role of agriculture in this worsening crisis as a major driver of climate itself, but also as a highly vulnerable sector and as presenting some potential solutions uh, through mitigation. There is, <coughs> excuse me, unless there is a genuine change in how we as donors engage in the global food system, we will simply be unable to honour our United Nations pledge to end hunger by 2030. Likewise, our global food system must be rapidly transformed, both to avoid contributing to climate change and also to adapt quickly to its impacts. And here in this part of the world, we can see that. We have island states that are disappearing. Uh, we have uh, sea lines that are changing and weather patterns that are leaving people uh, with, without uh, the, the means to grow food. As donors, our role is critical in supporting initiatives that will drive this change. <clears throat> While our individual investments in food systems are small compared to the investments of farmers and food sector businesses, they can be critical for empowering others to play their part. Optimising the catalytic role that do of donor support will therefore be key in responding to the outcomes of the Food System Summit, uh, whatever they may be. So who is the Global Donor Platform? Who are we? Uh, we are a network of 40 bilateral and multilateral agencies, international finance institutions, intergovernmental agencies and others that was established in 2003 to lobby for increased public and private investment in agriculture and rural development. And we have been doing that effectively ever since. In 2020, we were among the first to open a strong global dialogue on a number of key issues in the lead up to the Food Systems Summit. During our 2020 annual General Assembly, we identified critical issues, which has spurred coordination and harmonized action among global donors. These included catalyzing and de-risking finance and supporting greater policy innovation, among many other priorities. I now want to briefly outline the objectives of today's event, um, uh, just to give you a, a little bit of context setting. So I think today what we want to start doing is to build, start building that shared vision for food systems transformation in the lead up to the summit. And we want to hear from you, we want to hear from all of you, not just the, high, the keynote speakers, but the audience, your thoughts, your views. We want to discuss our priorities for future investment. What should they be? And explore more effective ways that we might seek to work together both globally and at the country level to take forward outcomes of the Food Systems Summit and try and achieve real and lasting change. And, and we realise it's been difficult. Multilateralism hasn't been strong in recent years. And I think we do have an opportunity and a responsibility to try and revive that spirit of multilateralism. The stock taking report that we have recently compiled, which will be a feature later on today, provides an overview of the current scale of the food system of food system funding and the types of actions currently supported by donors, mm -hmm. many donors around the table today. By gaining a clear understanding of what we fund and how we fund it, we can therefore identify key gaps and opportunities. We can help optimize our coordination and our alignment going forward. We will be following up the stock taking report with a white paper, uh, which will outline or seek to outline some really concrete options for donors to respond to the outcomes of the summit. Our session at the end of today's event will focus on this report and our exciting forward work plan as a platform. So today we have an amazing lineup for you. Um, we will start with our keynote presentation, 
followed by a, a fantastic group uh, at our, in our high level panel. Um, uh, and then lastly, at the end, a session on launching this top taken report. I'm shortly going to hand over to our keynote speaker, I'm sure to many of you, Jemima needs absolutely no introduction. Jemima is the International Food Policy Research Institute's Director for Africa. She has spent more than 20 years in gender equality and women's empowerment, both in Africa and Asia. Prior to joining IFPRI, she led the Growth and Economic Opportunity Program at Canada's IDRC, the Women in Agriculture Program at Care USA, and the Poverty, Gender and Impact Program at ILRI in Nairobi. She is the convener of East and Southern Africa Gender Livelihoods Network and the founding editor of the journal Gender, Agriculture and Food Security, a journal that seeks to promote voices of scientists from the global south who are working on gender equality. In 2020, Dr Njuki was named by the UN Food System Special Envoy as custodian for gender equality and women's empowerment for the UN Food System Summit. She has also been named as one of the top most influential people globally on gender policy. Dr Njuki, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to give our keynote tonight. Over to you. Thank you so much, Tristan. What an introduction. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. It's such a great pleasure for me to, to be here and to share my thoughts uh, on what I believe is the role of donors in food systems transformation. Um, with just over eight years to 2030, I know everybody keeps talking about 10 years, you know, the last decade, but we really just have eight years. Uh, to when we should be achieving the SDGs. Um, the imperative and urgency to act has never been greater. And this is especially critical in light of mounting evidence of rising hunger and malnutrition. And, and Tristan, you've, you've alluded um, to some of this. And while we all know what the situation really looks like, um, one of the things that I would like to do before I start is share the most recent st statistics again so that we can all be on the same uh, page in terms of the context of the challenge that we are currently dealing with. I'm going to share um, a couple of, of, of slides um, to, illustrate, um, to illustrate this. Um, Tristan mentioned this, um, that over 811 million people, that's 10% of the world's population, are hungry. But sometimes it's often difficult for people to see this as, as, as not just numbers, but real people. So this is roughly the combined population of the Philippines, Russia, Nigeria, Mexico, Japan, Ethiopia or simply put the population of all of Europe. And worryingly, there has been a 20% increase in just one year. In addition, about 2.3 billion people are going without a number of meals per day. Essentially for every three people on earth, one of them is malnourished. And we should be really worried about this. The COVID pandemic has just made a bird situation uh, worse. And in most developing countries, which were already struggling to deliver decent lives for their people, this level of hunger has resulted in destitution, erosion of human dignity. There is no worse form of human indignity than hunger. And worse still, an increasing loss of hope for the future, and especially among young people. But failing food systems, we have to put this in context. They don't just mean that parents are struggling to feed their children, but a lot of them can no longer afford to even send them to school, which is the surest path out of the cycle of poverty, especially in rural areas. But we know this has not always been um, the case. And I know this for a fact because I grew up in a small village on the foothills of Mount Kenya just about 150 kilometers northeast of, of Nairobi. And those days, what I remember is our parents were able to feed and send us to school from the proceeds of their five acre piece of land. 
on which all manner of crops grew from coffee to, to yams and maize and beans and, and vegetables. They had the right seeds at the right time. They had extension services available. The local market worked. And thanks to that effort, my seven siblings and I obtained high quality education. Some of us moved to other sectors of the economy. Most of us are actually no longer directly relying on firms um, for survival. But unfortunately, not many have escaped this poverty trap. I go back home frequently. I work a lot in rural areas. I went back home a few weeks ago to see my father who's been unwell. And as usual, a chance to go home is also a chance to see my childhood friends. And I have a longtime friend who still lives on the farm, Mama Dedes, as we call her now. She did not go beyond primary school. She now has seven children, grandchildren. All her children and their children are still relying on a small piece of land that is no longer productive enough um, for them. So land that used to be lush and productive is now constantly ravaged by, by drought. But even more importantly, it has been subdivided into small unproductive portions as population increases. So while the cocktail of challenges the world is facing, including climate change and population, are well acknowledged, what I believe and strongly believe is that stagnating and sliding back into poverty that we are seeing in most of our rural areas is inexcusable. So where do we go from, um, from here? Over the last 20 years, I have worked with rural women and girls in agriculture. I have worked in Africa. I have transversed most of Asia. And today I am probably for the first time filled with a lot of optimism that we are discussing the right issues um, through the global discussion that has been kicked off by the Food Systems Summit uh, that Tristan uh, mentioned earlier. While I'm still cautious in my optimism, uh, of course, I'm happy that we are no, long, no longer looking at food security and nutrition as an issue to be only dealt with by a Ministry of Agriculture, or by the few people that have been crazy enough like me to work in the agriculture sector for so many, uh, for so many years. We are finally bringing food systems thinking and the global community into issues of food and, and hunger. And for me, this meeting is so critical because it is good to see donors as well coming together for a reflection like this on what their role in transforming food systems is. So when Maurizio uh, wrote to me, the organizers of the meeting, they gave me latitude to offer my honest reflections on what I think your role should be. And fortunately, I'm no longer in the donor world. I was in IDRC for seven years until last year. So if I say something that does not sit well, please, you have to look for Maurizio. He accepted to have his head on the, on the table if I say anything inappropriate. <laughs> but all this just aside, we all, not just you, the donors, have to have really honest conversations if our work is to make um, a difference. As a start of my reflection, I would like to commend those that were involved in the in the production of the Ceres 2030 report, including my own institution, IFPRI. Because for the first time, we did have a blueprint to guide the way we channel investments um, and funds for meaningful impact, and especially to address food and nutrition insecurity, hunger, malnutrition. I would like to highlight just some key numbers that, that are in the report, just to remind us. So the report outlines 10 recommended interventions to end hunger, to double the incomes of 545 million small-scale farmers, and to limit agriculture emissions uh, in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. What the report also does is it gives us a breakdown of the required additional funding to make this happen. 330 billion US dollars up to 2030, 33 billion dollars a year. Some from donors, but also some from uh, middle income countries that they provide in addition to public um, spending. But the key question for me today is 
what should you as the donors do to actually ensure that there's money, these dollars we are referring to actually deliver the desired results? First, I want to begin with the fact that um, while funding is critical, and, and, and we had a conversation earlier today uh, as the meeting was starting about funding. Sometimes it is not the foremost problem because if it is not appropriately channeled, it can also cause problems. So why do I say this? Because the truth is even with the kind of funding we have, we shouldn't be seeing the kind of spike in hunger and malnutrition that we are witnessing today given the funds already going into the sector. Through my work with governments, with private sector and with development partners over the past many years, I believe a redesign of donor funding approach must happen. Otherwise, any additional funding that we are calling for could potentially go to waste. So while I agree with the 10 recommendations of the Series 2030 report, I would like to propose three broad areas requiring radical change for donor funding to work. I am going to be a bit territorial here and use Africa to illustrate my thoughts because that's where I am from. And after all, I think I can't get away with calling our spade a spade. So first, prioritization, prioritization, prioritization. Because every time I work across the region, you see dead, ineffective, moribund projects that deliver no real benefit to anyone other than those that they directly employ. The root cause of a lot of these failed projects is that they are never aligned to broad development plans and strategies of the countries that they are, where they are implemented. As most countries across the continent have competing priorities, we need to design investments in such a way that they go to top priorities, those that have the most impact on diverse populations. Now, these priorities have to be identified at the country level in close coordination and with full ownership of countries to ensure that they actually drive against the country's medium and long-term vision for the future. Prioritization also ensures that these funds are aligned with the country's capacities to absorb all the financial resources that are available to them. When resources are allocated to countries randomly, and I say randomly here very liberally, governments will most likely invest in areas that they can manage or that they have current capacity. I live in Kenya, I am from Kenya. If you were to give us a couple hundred million US dollars today, we are most likely to channel those funds to probably to input subsidy programs. Yeah. That are not always the most effective. Or yet to another series of trainings for farmers whose outcomes we probably will never know. Now, this prioritization is actually very much along the lines of what the Ceres 2030 report has shown by breaking down where the $33 billion annually should go. The suggestion that I'm making today is that this kind of prioritization needs to happen at the country level. It needs ownership at the country level. And I do not want, and I'm in no way suggesting that governments have fully figured out what their own prioritizations are. It is one of the things that we are doing as one CGIR. And as if pre, we've been working with countries to support the development of these plans and priorities, applying a food systems approach, paying particular attention to the inclusion of the vulnerable and marginalized groups, including women and youth, and to include these groups in the planning and in the suggestions of what these priorities should be. And part of the donor funding, actually the start of the pipeline for donor funding should actually go to this kind of work. It is the starting point for change. The second thing I wanna talk about is making sure 
the funding reaches those who need it most. This to me is one of the areas that really require urgent uh, action. Existing funds are not always accessible to the groups that need them most. And I'll give a couple of examples. Type, typically, most donor funds go to projects with very little going to Africa's agribusiness sector, for example. And as my personal story going, growing has shown, the relation. whether these markets are national or they are regional. But they, these SMEs hardly uh, attract the kind of funding that they need. And interestingly, in the region, most of these SMEs are run by, uh, by women. We have seen funds meant for businesses being channeled through development finance institutions that are not designed for the needs of the producers or of SMEs or of women owned businesses. Most of these DFIs are looking for large businesses and deals to invest between $5 million, $10 million at a minimum. Very few of these level of businesses in Africa are owned by women or owned by people in the continent, and neither do they have direct connection with the smallholder firmers that we are trying to, to reach. And incidentally, such small businesses do not even need $5 million. They do not even need $1 million. Sometimes they need half a million dollars or $100,000 to actually make the difference for the smallholder firmers they serve. And so my call is that investment funds should be redesigned to meet the needs of these businesses. In the long term, this will actually support much broader agendas like the African continent of free trade area. I'll give one quick example from, from India as well. Yeah. In India, a lot of women farmers are not recognized as bona fide farmers, but we know the roles that they play in food systems, right? They are regarded as wives or daughters of farmers. As a result, extension and investment programs are not always designed for them. And in, in instances like this, and I, I know the role of sending funds to universities because that's where a lot of innovations are coming from. But I also want to see some of those funds instead go to women's rights movements, women's organizations, women's cooperatives that are actually fighting for the recognition of women as farmers. The last thing I want to talk about as I close is coordination. Now, pick any country across Africa, and there are multiple players that are working in the sector. Most times, these players are operating with minimal coordination. And every effort should be made to ensure smooth coordination and accountability across government ministries, across development partners, across private sector entities, across the funders who are present in that country, across the implementing partners. Because this will not only ensure better delivery of results and accelerated development, but will also minimize duplication of efforts and wastage. And we know that even in country where that such coordination happens, that progress um, is visible. Now, as I conclude, I want to say prosperity is possible. I would like again to once commend you for taking this bold step and to look at how best you can support food systems transformation. As donors, you have the ability to foster good behavior by channeling your funds into initiatives that are transformational. We know now the level of hunger and malnutrition that we are grappling with is unacceptable. In a world that has made real, you know, reality defying advances in sectors. In a world where we're taking people to the moon, others are sleeping hungry. It is totally unacceptable. So we know we cannot continue as if things are the same. And of all the food systems actors, you donors have the greatest ability to turbocharge action to address this runaway hunger and malnutrition. 
But we also know we cannot transform our food systems without investments that are based on evidence-based country priorities, without investing in small businesses, SMEs, without investing and directly investing in women and in young people. I thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. And I look forward to continued discussion and action on some of these issues that I raise. Back to you, Tristan. Thank you so much, Jemima, um, for that powerfully direct, turbocharged even, and insightful lead-in to our moderated session. I was particularly struck by your discussion of uh, of, of not only targeting, but also coordination. And the, and the, the, the word that came to me as, as, I, as I was listening to you was that we need discipline as a community. I think we need to be far more disciplined than we are. And we need to hold each other accountable to standards of, of conduct, which I think we just at the moment ignore. So I, I would love to, to keep, to, to, to kind of keep the flavor of that going through this discussion, because I think it's really critical. I think without that, <clears throat> we're gonna struggle. So thank you again. I really enjoyed that presentation and I'm sure everyone else did. And we really appreciate your time and, and know how busy you are. <clears throat> On that thank note, you. I'd like to, uh, to welcome our moderator, Mr. Henry Bonsu. Henry is a leading international broadcaster <clears throat> and media consultant. He has worked with a range of channels, including BBC, Sky News, uh, MSNBC, TRT World, among many others. He's also moderated several major conferences and events, including this one, but the, at the United Nations, the Africa Union, and indeed the Global Fund. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Henry. Take it away, Henry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tristan, for that. It was a lovely introduction. And Jemima, what can I say? That was powerful. It was pithy. It was to the point. You asked us to be honest because it's only with honesty that we can be more productive. And sometimes we have to get used to feeling uncomfortable because that will trigger us into acting differently. I like the fact that you prioritize three areas very neatly, and we're going to build on that. So thank you very much indeed. Now, here's my opening thoughts before I introduce our panel. I mean, think about what's happening more broadly in the world. Yes. The picture that Tristan painted at the very beginning was in some respects a real wake-up call. I mean, thinking about the number of people in the world who go hungry, linking that to the broader discussion on climate change, the fact that we're at war with our planet. Think about what Jemima said about how the land that was so fertile in her youth and that sustained the ambitions of eight people she and her several sib seven siblings is no longer so productive. The time is now, we have to act. At the same time, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty and are eating and are having nourishing meals. But the way we produce food is no longer sustainable. So how do we build on the successes and how do we manage to crush those failures? In this next hour and a half or so, we're going to look at how we do things differently in a sustainable way that maintains and is in cooperation with our beautiful, unique planet. So what difference can donors really make to the way we finance, to the way we create policy, and the way we coordinate between the different actors, as Jemima was emphasizing? Difficult questions, but thankfully we have a panel equal to the task. We do indeed, you can see their wonderful faces in the boxes on your screens. We have Herda Verberg, UN Assistant Secretary General and Coordinator of the Sun Movement, former Minister of Agriculture in the Netherlands, Netherlands and a former permanent representative to the FAO, WFP and IFAD. She's gonna stay with us for our first hour, but then she's gonna dash off for another commitment. We've got Jim Barnard, Assistant to the Administrator at USAID, he leads the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and is Deputy Coordinator for Feed the Future, which is the US's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative. We have Giorgio Marapodi, Director General for Development Cooperation, 
Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Internal Cooperation for Italy. He's a seasoned diplomat who's been permanent representative at the UN in New York and to the EU in Brussels. He knows how government works. So we'll be unlocking his brain and expertise on this. We have Alvaro Lario, officer in charge, associate VP for external relations and governance and associate VP and chief financial officer at IFAD. We have Carla Montesi, the director, the Directorate General for International Partnerships. She's responsible for, as she's smiling at me, for the Green Deal and Digital Agenda. A former director for Planet and Prosperity at Development Corporation, DEFCO, at the European Commission. And Martin Walia, CEO of Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADAP, under the NEPAD Planning and Coordinating Agency, specialist in the negotiation and management of partnerships with multilateral and bilateral institutions. And we have Professor Andrew Campbell, who's the CEO of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, who's played influential roles in sustainable agriculture and nature resource management in Australia for a very long time. So panelists, we have to cover a lot of ground over the next 80 or so minutes as we build up to the launch of the GDPRD stock taking report that Tristan was uh, talking about earlier. And that will look at donors contribution to food systems. So we now are gonna focus on financing, how to catalyze it and de-risk it, policy change, how do we create the right incentives to do things differently and coordinating and aligning different actors at the global and local level. And all those of you, over 130 or so of you, are growing all the time. We wanna hear from you throughout this session. So please send your brief questions and comments using the chat box facility at the bottom of your screen. I can see lots of people are engaging already. So thank you very much indeed. But okay, so building on what Jemima has said, the food for thought that she is nourishing us with panelists, I'd like you to each outline three things that you think donors should focus on to help drive a food systems transformation. So in two minutes, each of you, just give us your headlines. I'm gonna start off with Gerda Ferberg from the Sun Movement. Gerda, over to you, your three priorities. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Henry. And thank you organizers for being so brave to do stock taking first and have this conversation. It's not an easy conversation and in line with the excellent uh, openings uh, remarks of Jemima, I would like to address my uh, three priorities. The first is um, focus on countries. Don't drive your own priorities. Um, every solution in food systems need to be owned by countries and owned by governments. So be there in the national uh, food dialogues, food systems uh, dialogues. Focus on priorities and make sure that the government is investing first and then align behind the government. What do I mean? And it's all experience of the scaling up nutrition movement. Um, a government that uh, um, put um, its money where its mouth is will follow up and is serious about transition and improvement. If not, if there is only an agenda and the donors are requested to come in to pay, um, it is uh, a lost attempt and it will not lead to structural and systemic change. Then in the same uh, uh, vision, it is the coordination between, uh, between the donors. Coordinate amongst yourself before you align and coordinate uh, uh, behind the government, focusing on uh, priorities. And this is my first uh, um, and, and, and most important uh, uh, point, I think. Um, and I like the word that was used already, discipline, uh, coordinate and discipline about amongst, uh, co amongst the donors. Secondly, the focus on nutrition is not strong enough when it comes to agriculture and rural development. So um, um, I'm very much in favor of having an equal focus on uh, nourishing people and nutrition, the right nutrition less on productivity and crop production, yield improvement, but quality improvement, uh, sustainability, biodiversity, and of course, but it's contra the interest of many donors, start the food value chain where food is produced, because it is the way to create uh, jobs, 
to create prosperity, to escape poverty, and to uh, decrease food losses. So this is my uh, second point, in, invest in nourishment of people and planet um, and prosperity in creating uh, jobs and the food value chain close to where food is produced. My third point is the desperate need for a um, change of mindset. Um, also with donors, when we are really to implement the sustainable development goals, nobody can uh, stay into uh, his or her comfort zone. What do I mean? Think global. Uh, we are at war with the planet. We are at war because we are losing the nourishment of, uh, uh, of people and we are losing a lot of prosperity. But stop with investment in projects and programs. They will not do the trick. They're only reaching people. They are not changing the perspective of people. They are not focused on ownership of people and communities of the solutions. So if you are to invest, invest in systemic change, not only in policy, but also in institutional uh, change so that um, um, uh, the change is there to stay and is there to continue even uh, if the investment is, uh, is over. Finally, um, women and youth first. And I can only emphasize what has been said by uh, Yemima already uh, on this. Um, youth is everywhere um, and women are lagging, still lagging uh, behind. And we should stop uh, lip service, but really bring systemic and structural change to um, focus at least equally, but prioritize for the first time because they are lagging so far behind the investment in female women uh, in the rural area. Thank you, back to you, Henry. Thank you very much indeed. As I suspected, you gave me far more than three. You gave me far more, but it's, but it's an embarrassment of riches and it builds on what we've heard before and it gives, it's gonna catalyze the discussion in a magnificent way. So thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go to Jim Barnhart, who is the assistant to the administrator at USAID. So Jim, in two minutes, if you can, your three priorities. Good morning and afternoon and evening, Henry and, 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 and everyone. Um, <laughs> what an incredible opening. Um, uh, thanks to you and to the, the Global Donor Platform for, for hosting this already exciting event. And for me, it's, it's a little after 7 a.m. and I'm already feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm well energized for the day. Jemima set the tone and I, and I want to build on that. Um, number one, um, ownership, ownership, ownership. Um, throughout my career, and I, I, I've spent most of my career in the field overseas and the developed both in, in government and in non-government, the most successful programs are ones that are not, uh, that, are, that are owned and led by host country partners. And I, and I include government, civil society, private sector. If, if the donors are not allowing the um, host country partners to lead the agenda, to, to, to guide them, and I mean us, then we, we end up having to impose um, solutions. It's one of the, I see it all the time. We have donors have solutions looking for problems. We go around the world looking for problems. Instead, we need to be listening, listening and be humble in the way we approach our engagement with our, with our, host, with our host country partners. Um, but, and, and Gert mentioned this, it's critical that we make sure that our host country partners have skin in the game, that they're investing their own resources. If they're not, then it is, Whatever we're doing is, is doomed for failure. Um, and um, we have to in, ensure that, um, <laughs> that we're bringing all, all of the right partners together. Um, and, and donors can play a role in making sure that all, everyone is at the table and we are listening, we are listening and we are being humble. Secondly, the, the great thing that donors can do is we can bring scale to global, engage, global uh, initiatives research and development, multilateral inclusive financing, all of those kinds of things that happen uh, um, internationally are the sorts of things that we can then bring to the table as potential opportunities um, for scaling. And so uh, whether that's working with our CGIAR systems, whether that's working with GASP on financial inclusion, um, there are multiple um, tools that, um, that we have access to that we can then bring to the, to the fore. Um, finally, we need to make sure that when we work on, when we work to it, to, to, to support true country ownership, 
that all the people are at the table. It has to be inclusive. It has to include women, it has to include youth, it has to include uh, marginalized populations in whatever um, partner country we're working with. And too often we talk about reaching the most vulnerable. No, no, we don't need to be reaching them. We need to be giving them agency and leadership. And again, following their, um, their um, the direction for us um, in terms of where we put our, our resources. So let me stop there. I think I've gone over two minutes, Henry, back to you. But thank it's exciting to be part of this conversation. That's right. You're on time, you're on budget. So thank you very much indeed. They're tremendous. So, so far from Cheda and Jim, we've looked at um, the priorities, focusing on countries, coordination amongst yourselves first. Think about nutrition, food value chain, where food's produced. Um, stop with the investments on projects. Look at systemic change. Then Jim, focusing on ownership in the field where he's done a lot of his work, you know, and these countries must also invest their own skill in the game. They have to have something to gain or lose, uh, bring scale and be inclusive. Tremendous. Let's go to Ifad. Uh, Alvaro, Lario. Yes. Okay. So um, let's hear what you have to say in, in two minutes, those three areas for you that are priority. Yes. Over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by thanking all members for the trust in IFAD. We are hosting the GDPRD Secretariat since 2020 and uh, also for the invitation to speak today. So I'll try to be very brief. There have been some topics on skin in the game, the size of the investments. Many of them are related to the finance. So to support the food system transformation, uh, in my view, donors need to focus on three top priorities. The first one will be obviously increasing the financial investments. Second one, catalyzing and de-risking financing. And the third one would be to promote decent working condition and decent wages. So I'll, I'll speak very briefly on, on the three. On the first one, on increasing financial investments for food systems, the scale of funding of food systems is very modest. It's like 8% of ODA. So one potential strategy that we are looking in, in also in IFAD, and I'll share some examples in these two minutes, would be to lever the power also of public development banks. I mean, these institutions can have a critical role in redirecting and expanding their investments and also on supporting women and young entrepreneurs when they are often excluded from the financial systems. I mean, they can also mobilize capital, take on more market development risks, and, and that's a, a key. We're having soon an event, but I, I'll also talk on it later. Uh, another key intervention, obviously, is catalyzing and de-risking financing. So to establish robust and resilient value chain, it's important to understand the weakest link in every chain. So that means what are the risks that other actors do not want to take, whether well, it's related to financing, to productivity, to logistics, trade restrictions, sustainability of the demand. So um, for this, you need obviously to take all the stakeholders, farmers, banking, private sector, and it's always not easy. Um, and, and Jamina mentioned the high transaction costs, some of this the risking. We have put together a fund called ABC Fund, which works from 50,000 to a million investments, and we can share. Also, we recently had a credit rating, which will also enable us on guarantees. But let me just finalize with the, with the last one um, in terms of uh, the strongly promoting decent working conditions and decent wages um, for all food system workers. So IFAD is also partnering with ILO on the coalition of an action on decent work and living incomes and wages which will advance equitable livelihoods. And this is also something that will include achieving 100% living incomes and wages, which is very important on the day to day for these families and ensuring the economic and social justice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alaro. I'm speaking on behalf of IFAD and giving us the financial perspective. I'm sure we'll build on that very shortly. Let's go to Giorgio Marapodi, Director General for Development Cooperation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy. He's a seasoned diplomat. He's been permanent representative at the UN in New York and to the EU in Brussels. So, Giorgio, over to you. Lovely to hear what you have to say on behalf of Italy. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. And uh, let me first say that I found also very in, uh, inspiring the words of, of Jemina. Um, in only a couple of weeks, we will uh, virtually gather for the Food System Summit in, uh, in, in New York. A lot of work uh, was done in Rome at the end of July in the, the pre-summit and uh, changing the food systems, it's something we all agree and we all agreed also in Rome, cannot wait longer. To do that, we need to mobilize funds, but also ideas and energies. And today, taking into consideration the work which was done uh, in, uh, in Rome, the, the work that was done also by Italy as G20 presidency, 
I will also highlight three points. First, I think as, uh, as uh, other colleagues said, I think that we need to catalyze additional funding, promoting engagement and partnership among governments, private investors, international financial institutions, as it was mentioned by the colleague from, from IFAD and development banks. In order to succeed in this effort, we must aim to reduce risks for investors in the agriculture sector and improve access to credit, especially for smaller farmers. These issues will be discussed at the Financing Common Summit, which Italy will host in Rome in October. Second, we must build on the most recent commitments in a synergic manner. To lead the way of where to target investment, we see the G20 Matera Declaration, I think this is not surprising you, on food security and its six action areas. Women and youth uh, empowerment, social protection system, climate action on the One Health approach, investment and international trade. We should also promote a connection between uh, the work done in Matera, Rome and New York, making sure that the outcome of the summit is consistent with the work done and the most relevant upcoming high level events. We cannot forget that we are, yes, as I said, we have the food system summit, but then immediately after that, there will be the, the pre-COP in Milan and the COP26 uh, on the climate change. And then the summit, the financing common in October and uh, at the end of October, the G20 leaders summit. Third, a coordinated response to food crisis goes through an interconnected analysis of the different global challenges, climate change, conflicts and instability, biodiversity loss, health emergencies. We must look to the implementation of the commitment taken at the Food System Summit, highlighting, highlighting the importance of coordinated and ambitious action beyond silos and the taking into account the interconnected nature of the food systems. Rather than doing, and I conclude, rather than doing differently, I would rather say doing more efficiently. The follow-up to the Food System Summit will be very, very important to make sure that the commitments will be implemented and that the momentum is kept. The Rome-based agencies will have to work closely and in a coordinated manner for the implementation of the commitments in close coordination with all the actors that have been beneficial to a shared agenda, both at the global and national level. Thanks, Henri, and over to you. Thank you very much indeed to Giorgio Marapodi speaking on behalf of Italy, uh, Director General for Development Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. OK, let's get a perspective from the European Commission now. Carlo Montesi uh, is with us. So Carlo, let's get your three priorities. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from Professor Andrew Campbell. Um, so yes, Carla, Carla, over to you. Many, many, many thanks, Harry. I, I was smiling because you promote me in my presentation. Um, allow me to say that full support with uh, the, the inspiring uh, Gimina recommendation on the, on the three broader areas, frankly, we fully support the three priorities that, uh, that she mentioned. Uh, now, on, uh, on the priorities in, uh, from our own support, as you for supporting the food system transformation, I will mention maybe three, three areas. We really would like to invest more in making value chain sustainable. And when we talk about the sustainable, we, we uh, are covering the three dimensions, the economic, the social, and the environmental sustainability. Uh, allow me to, to mention the, the, our initiative on, on the EU Sustainable Cocoa Initiative that we are preparing with Ghana and the Cote d'Ivoire, where we are working with the private sector, farmers, and NGO, the public to improve the livelihood of farmers, halting deforestation, and the child labor. What is different? It's a new way of working, which we can see ourselves as the facilitator, but uh, we are working through this sustainability agenda really in partnership with all the relevant local actors, private and, and the public. So really action 
new ownership at the local level, as Jimena was stressing. Second element to, to achieve this food transformation will be clearly our work, our investment in research and innovation for sustainable practice. Um, we need to do much more in promoting the climate sensitive agriculture to identify uh, all the new technology that will really uh, allow us to take into account the climate change in the agriculture. We have uh, launched our program and we are implementing our program at Desira that is, uh, uh, of course, looking in particular to climate relevant practice in sustainable agriculture, but much more has to be done and we really need to expand the knowledge base on, on agriculture that seems to be one of the solution. Third element, uh, following also what Gerda said and Jimena said, is really we need to continue to pay attention to the most vulnerable uh, people living in food crisis. Uh, we know that the COVID is taking attention, I would say in some way, away from this uh, crucial matter, but uh, figures are again negative and we really, uh, as a donor, uh, continue to join, for example, the global network against the food crisis and continue to work together in analyzing, preventing and preparing the food crisis. Now, allow me just to say that the burden of the food crisis should not be left only to the humanitarian agency because we really need to continue to focus on the long-term involvement from the development side. So we need to continue to work with all the key actors who will be the peace actor, really ensuring a nexus approach to address the root causes and avoid that uh, the, the local food system will be uh, collapsed when we are in front of a crisis. So these three uh, action, uh, I would say these three priorities will be taken into account in our future action uh, to implement the food system approach uh, in support to um, our partners' countries. Over to you, Henri. Hello, tremendous. Thank you very much indeed. So we're seeing a degree of alignment in the three priorities that um, each of you have mentioned thus far. Some differences, of course, and one would expect that with a diverse range of organizations, but some very clear and you might say welcome um, alignment between the parties. Okay, let's go to Professor Andrew Campbell uh, from the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research. Over to you, uh, Andrew. Thank you, Henry. I'm going to focus my remarks primarily from the science and research perspective. I completely agree with uh, the comments of my fellow panellists uh, and the wonderful keynote from Jemima. Uh, but as Carla has just uh, identified, if you're going to transform food systems, then obviously business as usual is not going to get you there. Um, so we are going to need a level of innovation in the food system, not just agriculture, that is unprecedented. If you think about the big causes of greenhouse gas emissions in the energy sector, emissions intensity is coming down. In the transport sector, it's coming down. The food system is on track to be the biggest cause of greenhouse gas emissions and our emissions are going up. So. There's a level of innovation required, which will be unprecedented in human history, how to produce more food, healthier food, more equitably shared, but from a smaller footprint. So understanding that whole system is my first point, not just the technology, but the social, cultural, policy, institutional dimensions, markets and power. So we will need social science alongside really clever economics and policy science, and of course, our traditional disciplines of agronomy and so on. That work will have to be underpinned by clever foresighting about the climates that we're going into, not the current climate. We need to be thinking five, 10, 20, 50 years ahead of what sort of climate we're going to be needing to produce food in. As Jemima said, we have way too many small projects and programs that are duplicative, fragmented, not sufficiently owned in the, con the context in which they're being uh, funded. So we need donors to coordinate and collaborate and work together. 
but there's no point doing a big complicated collaboration if you only move at the speed of the slowest partner. So it's important that if you're going to invest in the transaction costs of collaboration, that you actually take more risks and build more critical mass than each of the partners could on their own. And that is the tricky thing, which in my view requires very skilled partnership brokering. And that's something that we've got to get better at. And it's not just having the same usual partners around the table. The food system is connected to pretty much everything else. This global pandemic that we're in now started in the food system. The food system is the biggest thing that humans do on planet Earth. So it should be possible for us to create new alliances with other parts of civil society. And frankly, some of them that have a lot more money uh, as it's pointed out, only 8% of, uh, of aid funding currently goes into this area. There's a lot of scope for us to do innovative new partnerships that give us more resources. So they're my three things, Henry. Si business as usual won't get us there. Take a systems perspective, collaborate and innovate as never before, and that's going to require really skilled investment in partnership brokering to make sure that those partnerships are more adventurous and not just incrementalism. Tremendous, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'm just looking at uh, the variety of suggestions and the, the common themes, and you're all in a way honing in on the kind of change that's required and systemic change that has to be truly transformational, the likes of which perhaps we haven't seen before. So the question is, what does that really look like? What is meant by this kind of systemic change? How will we know it when we see it? So I'm going to ask you, Jim, first of all, what do you mean by systemic change? What does it look like? Have you got any examples? How big a shift are we talking about here? Because as Andrew said, the food system is the biggest thing that we as human beings actually do. What do you think, Jim? It's a, it's a super question, Henry, and there's a lot of different ways to cut at it. Um, and, and there's so many things, interesting things that the fellow panelists said that I've been taking note of that I wanted to circle back to. But okay, so the, your question is really on sort of that big picture. How do we look at this as a, as a system and what do we need to do? I, I would I'd start with what, with, with Andrew's points that he was just making in terms of the of this issue of, of, of research and innovation in a, in a claim and in, in a changing world where, where, where climate is changes accelerating around us, um, we have to innovate our way out of this. And we're going, it has to, and there are there are CG systems, there's in, there are other research institutions around the world that are coming up with really incredible solutions and ideas. But how do we get those to the countries that need them? We've got to figure out scale. And that's one of the things that we work with in our Feed the Future program in, um, within the US government is we have 21 innovation labs. We work with them in the US and we, we are trying to take those innovations, those research ideas and figure out how you then get them to the field. Scaling in, in the local context is critical. And so making the linkage between the research, the lab with the, the smallholder farmer is something that we that is a challenge for all of us. It continues to be. We've made a lot of progress, but there's quite a bit more that we have to do if we're going to address that kind of systemic change at the very basic level of the, the smallholder farmer. We also, I think, as donors, need to rethink how we talk about what we do. Um, we have a tendency because it, it's a, it's our way of of, of, of a, our narrative persuasion to talk about people, we talk about wanting to support individuals, right? But what's really needed, and I think Carla mentioned this, um, certainly Greta mentioned this, and, and Jemima mentioned this, is we need to think about how we are supporting host country systems. And that's not as sexy to talk about, right? Um, we, people don't really want to hear about how, how an organization, a, 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 um, a, a farmer extension program, needs to expand and how you bring in smallholder farmers and how you bring in agribusiness. But that's really, that's, that's where the systems approach has to come in, right? 
and we don't we, we don't want to talk about it. We we want to talk about well, we've reached you know three you know two million people, and we've we've saved them over this particular period. But that is often simply non-sustainable humanitarian assistance, which helps somebody get through you know a community get through a a crisis, but doesn't help in the long run. It doesn't get to the root causes that that we've heard about, right? So we we have to be we have to be willing to talk about systems with our both amongst ourselves and frankly with a, a lot of our taxpayers and donors um, uh, around the world and be willing to address the fact that we are looking at long-term systemic change and not um, trying to help that that that, that very basic emergency um, uh, appeal approach. So I don't know if that makes sense, Henry, but it, it, it is something that I think we, we have to take on um, and particularly a lot of the Honestly, a lot of the implementing partners that we work with, we need to have them step up and think broader about how we allow host country ownership and systemic uh, strengthening. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, a couple of nods by fellow panelists. That's good. I'm, I'm not sure. completely. Yeah, let's see right. what some of our other panelists think about this uh, because it's really important. And as somebody who works in the communication business, sometimes it's very difficult to get that across to the people. Who are funding this part of it? You know, ultimately the taxpayers of uh, these various countries. Carla, I can see you're you're nodding. Um, mm -hmm. What do you understand by um, systemic change? What's your thought on this? Yes, uh, allow me to, to 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 join the conversation because this element is very very important. Jimena mentioned very well, and all the others, but the, it's a crucial one. Uh, you look when when we are saying in Europe what we are doing for the this food system and transformation, we have launched a clear strategy, the farm to fork strategy, where we really want to move away from this traditional settler approach characterized by all the different policies, just to ensure an integrated approach. And inside Europe, we have asked to all the country in Europe to prepare their own pathway in which they think they would like to mention this transformation. And this is exactly the, the things that we need to, to do with all the partners. So if we really want to, to succeed in this food transformation, each country need to prepare this, their national pathway. So, it, and we really want to support ourselves this, this, this process. So we are working with FAO, we are working with Italy, with IFAD, the Northern to ensure that for each country, we have in some way a food system analysis, a food assessment uh, in order to achieve this transformation country by country, take into account the multi-stakeholders discussion at the country level. So we, as a donor, we really need to ensure that in each country we have this national pathway and we all come together with a strong coordination in supporting the country in implementing their national in preparing and of course in implementing this national pathway. This has to be the systematic approach. We are doing in Europe mobilizing private sector and the public sector all together and I think it's the work that we need to to be done in all the different countries. Thank you very much indeed for that Carla, it's tremendous, thank you. Okay, now we're kind of moving around a little bit and, and some of our other panelists may um, have further thoughts on the systemic side of this discussion but I want to follow this particular narrative that I highlighted at the beginning and if you want to bring the systemic answer into it, you can. But I'd mentioned at the beginning, finance, policy, innovation, and alignment. And each of you, in your own ways, in your three points, has also talked about this. But let's drill down a little bit um, on finance. And a number of you have mentioned um, the ways in which we have to catalyze and de-risk financing in a way that will benefit all actors. Yes, we're talking about an increasing 14 billion a year, the series 23 called for last year. My thoughts, my thoughts are, is that realistic? And can it be achieved? But fundamentally, what is the best way of catalyzing and de-risking financing? Uh, Alvaro, you're a finance man. You're a finance guy, you brought finance in. So let, let me put that to you. Um, catalyzing and de-risking, how are we gonna do this? Thank you very much, Henry. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to also share that uh, among ODA 
today, and as the Duke report has pointed out, many of the aid was bilateral, like more than 70% was bilateral. I think multilateralism, we are a big believer, obviously, and I think that coordination comes from there. The new resident coordination system at the UN system could be a way of getting all of these priorities together, in the national pathways and talking with, with the country. So it's still in the making. I think we, we can make it work better. I'm not a, I'm a very pragmatic person. We have driven a lot of changes in IFAD through, through this uh, pragmatism and trying. So let me share some of the challenges we have had. As an example, the ABC fund with, uh, with, um, with the EU, which has helped mm -hmm. us in trying to address the missing middle. We, are, um, we put together a fund in which we were lending to small farm holders, especially young people who, who were uh, with their business, 50,000 type of tickets up to a million. And there you see the reality of the difficulty of the costs of how they're balanced between the financing and the impact. And that's the real day-to-day -day life on, on the difficulties of how to put this together. At the more systemic and organizational point of view, we have just started a private sector also arm if it has been lending on sovereign lending for 40 years, we do believe that's not enough. There needs to be this dialogue with the private sector too. We have put together for the last two years, we have started an arm with private sector. And this is little by little disrupting organizations, trying things new, which are difficult, are complicated. That's why people do not do them. We have just been the first UN fund to get a credit rating. This side we do believe will help us to also mobilize and de-risk local balance sheet as an example in terms of trying to promote more lending to certain, obviously, women, young entrepreneurs using that credit rating. So using all of these, let's say, less uh, theoretical and more practical means, we have to all work on them. And this has been some of the aspects we have been trying to do in mobilizing. They are not easy. They require new ways of thinking, new ways of really interacting with other partners. We have been, as I said, really um, well uh, funded and supported by many of the donors in doing this. But I think that's that's the way, trying to new things, partnering with others, and I'll, I'll, I'm being very pragmatic. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in small steps, and I think that's the way forward. Thank you. That's tremendous. And that's small steps, uh, that's the way forward. Gerda, speaking on behalf of the Sun Movement, um, are these steps big enough? Are they too small? Is this kind of transformation radical enough as far as you're concerned, especially when it comes to catalyzing and de-risking financing in the way Alvaro was uh, saying. Um, thank you very much. And thank you all um, uh, panelists. I don't think that it start with, uh, with, with uh, financial issue and capital um, and investment, financial investment. It all starts uh, with rethinking the food systems that are there at the country level to build on where they are and to do it in a way that can be owned by the countries. Changing food systems is a matter of political will. If there is no political commitment, if there is no political uh, traction on it, um, then uh, the international uh, community can do and donors can do what they want, but there won't be the systemic change. There will not be an improvement of, uh, of nutrition. There won't be an improvement of biodiversity and, and, uh, and um, uh, stopping climate change, uh, etc there will not be economic uh, development. So um, my experience is that this needs to, needs to happen first with all um, uh, people involved, all actors involved around the table. And I would like to recommend, because I very much appreciate what Andrew said in his first contribution and what Jim said, the um, international um, donor uh, group and the rural, this rural group is brave, uh, to take this on, you need to rethink because you will not get the food systems uh, done in the way if you continue to operate as you did. Um, if you continue to do what you did, you get what you want. So change is needed and um, donors need to ask themselves, how can we collaborate? How can we align behind the government and how can we focus behind country initiatives um, in such a way that we contribute to financial investment, but also to human capacity uh, investment, because one without the other uh, is not good enough. And then the second point is, and I told, I said it already, stop thinking in programs and projects, think in changing the life and, uh, and, and um, uh, the life and situation 
of communities and families so that they can drive their own future. That is the systemic change we need, that they continue after the, um, after the contribution um, uh, has stopped to bring this uh, change. So I never, in the Sun Movement, we never start with finance. We first get a sound plan where everybody is involved. Then we get the priority setting. Then we get the first investment from the uh, government. And then we try to align all the donors and investors uh, around it, which is still difficult because global um, and also bilateral uh, donors very often have their own priorities and they want to drive their own priorities also at country level. Thank you very much, Gerda. Um, Andrew then, uh, let me bring you back in. So if we are turning things upside down, as Gerda in a way says we should, because I talked about finance, he says, no, we shouldn't start with finance. Talk about the priorities, first of all, and build from there. And the finance is almost the last thing, because once you know what you do, you're doing and why you're doing it, then you can get the money and finance the priorities and according to the country priorities. Uh, um, but you also talk about the political will. So, uh, uh, Andrew, from what you're seeing, and you've been in the business a long time as well, is the political will there? If not, where is it going to come from? Who's going to kind of, um, I mean... It's, it's difficult if that political will isn't there. How do you create it? Uh, thanks, Henry. Just backing up a little bit about your finance question, there is an enormous amount of finance in the system now. I think there are estimates as much as a trillion dollars US in agricultural subsidies, many of which are subsidising what we don't want. So that is a very good place to start is is in redirecting the existing finance in the system to incentivize the systems and behaviors that that meet the goals around nutrition and reducing environmental footprint particularly not just greenhouse but also water is absolutely crucial and biodiversity so too many of our subsidies at the moment drive the wrong uh, systemic changes so that's a very prospective place to start. And the beauty of food, as, as I said before, it's connected to everything else, all of us eat. So that's where the political will comes from, is the, is the more enlightened consumer and the value chain actors who want to be able to um, uh, market their produce in ways that, that appeal to people who are oriented towards the future. Now, this is different, obviously, from a subsistence agriculture context that, um, uh, that I think we're talking about a different range of, of interventions there. But, but in the broader market-based system, we've got to do a lot more with consumers and a lot more with getting value chains the right size. We've developed a global food system with incredibly long, complex value chains, and now we're seeing the risks associated with those. This is not to say that everyone needs to be self-sufficient with what they grow in their own backyard or on their own balcony, but there's a lot more room for growing more closer to where people consume and for what we call circular economy approaches where we turn what's currently wasted back into nutrients or food or water or energy or sometimes all of those things. So there's a lot of scope for innovation if we rethink the wiring, the plumbing, the wiring, the, the, the way in which the system is organised. It's not about incremental change, it's reconceiving systems. And I think COVID has given us a fabulous opportunity to do just that. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Uh, I've been asking people to send in their questions through the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of their screen and a number of people have done so. Uh, let's see if we can get a couple of questions uh, answered here, um, answer live. It's a Carol Boudreau says, um, small and unsecured plots may well jeopardize the sustainability of farming in some countries. Supporting more women and men to rent in, rent out agricultural lands with confidence could be an important element of change. So to participatory consensual land use consolidation. What can be done to support partners on these fronts and what good examples can you share? Who would like to answer that? I'm just looking to see anybody nodding. Uh, 
Now, Andrew, you're looking at you. You're, you're still with me. Do you want to answer with that? I think it's a very good point, Henry. Um, uh, I, from a poverty reduction point of view, we understandably tend to focus on the on smallholder farmers and landless people. But I, I think there's a lot to be gained by focusing on on the semi-commercial uh, farmer and these sorts of systems where people can aggregate plots to have a more uh, a, a more viable um, production unit. They're very exciting potential. So there's a I think your the question that Carol there has has identified one of the prospective areas for us to work with. That's not to say, of course, we ignore uh, the, the people that don't have enough land or the landless, but it's a different type of intervention for them. Thank you very much indeed for that. And we have another uh, question here. Um, let's have a look from Khamson, who says, you've been sharing some very good points of view. There are some ODA supports at the policy level and some at practical level, i.e. tangible funds to support young women SME startups. The challenge is, how do you streamline and coordinate these supports? Well, that's one of the broader and overarching questions. Um, so let's uh, see if Jim, would you want to uh, talk about how to streamline? Because you did um, talk about that a little bit in one of your earlier contributions. How are we going to streamline the efforts and the work that we're doing? Yeah, I, I think that all of us donors, as, 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 as this panelist, our, our group of panels are, need to think through and, and ask ourselves some hard questions about our what are we willing to give up in terms of um, um, our flag, right? Um, and so I think both at the headquarters level, where, where I currently sit, um, you know, we are having um, broad discussions on how we can be more catalytic, creative, and, and collaborative on the financing front and on the on the programmatic front um, to ensure that um, <laughs> we're willing to 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 work in a in a multilateral fashion at a, in a collaborative way across um, with other donors, with private sector, civil society, and not necessarily have to make it all about our projects and our programs. So I think once we step out of that and we're willing to to be have open discussions with others on this, that then there are opportunities, whether they be um, the the um, the global agriculture food security program that the bank runs. There are a number of um, um, uh, yeah, we're talking about Africa. Um, there are a number of regional based um, de-risking programs that are on the finance side that we can join and be a part of a multilateral effort. Um, now, what we need to make sure is, though, my experience with a lot of the multilateral efforts has been that they get stuck at the, again, at the corporate headquarters level, and they're not having the effects on the ground that we want to see. And so that's why it's critical that we, we go back to the basics that Jemina started us with, which is to ensure in our partner countries where we're operating, are we following the leadership of our host country partners in the government, civil society, private sector? If we're not doing that, then we can create as many large, you know, these, these multilateral approaches from a, a, a corporate level. That's not going to have the desired effect that we want to see on the ground. And so we can model at a headquarters level, as we're doing on this panel, because all of us are, are HP folks, the way we want to work together. But then we've got to make sure that that's happening in the field. And that our, our, our people that are working in our host country partners, our, our host countries, are then in the same way collaborating across um, um, the multiple platforms within their own countries, but, but in, in lockstep with the, with the host country government. That's, that's the fundamental essence of this. And I, and I, we, so I, I keep circling back to that because I think that is the, what we need to be focused on. Henry, do you allow me to come in? Because I need to leave um, shortly. Yeah, yes, both yeah. you, Geda, and uh, Khala, both you, Geda, and Khala are going to leave us very shortly. So let's hear from you and then Khala before she leaves. Yeah. Please, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I am very much in agreement with Jim. And I wouldn't have uh, bet on this uh, before, but I think donors need to rethink. At the same time, um, so what are we going to change and what do we stop doing? And please stop.
stop thinking in projects and programs and please stop in uh, giving the message we know what to do we need the money and then we can do it so let's do it let's bring the money and then let's do it this is not uh, bringing the change i think um donors also need to think how can we um uh, also start to think against our own short notice interests because if you start the food value chain if you are really to uh, start to have create jobs in uh, uh, countries that produce the raw materials um is it isn't it against your short um, uh, term interest of your country and will you get support for it but you need to think about it the point about subsidies rethinking subsidies how do you do this in a way that you don't get um, uh, war within the current recipients, uh, with the current recipients, because they will start to lobby immediately. So how can you change also funding um, uh, uh, approaches, the very siloed uh, approach in uh, different uh, funding initiatives, and bring them through incentivizing closer together collaboration is the answer focusing on uh, and aligning behind country government is um, uh, a second part of the answer and creating ownership uh, for the people in the country or the, the country itself is uh, the third part of the answer. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks to Carla. Carla had to leave us, uh, sadly. And Georgia also had to leave us. There's a lot, of, a lot going on at the moment, but we still have some speakers left. And so that means you're going to have more airtime in the final in the final half hour because there are a number of questions that I really want to get your thoughts and on and your answers uh, to. Uh, Alvaro, uh, here's one. Um, I'm wondering about consensus. I'm wondering about alignment because that is one of the well. It's not an elephant in the room because people have mentioned it, okay. But uh, I'm just wondering how much more consensus or alignment is needed among donors on the kind of action that is required to actually transform food systems because people agree in principle that need, this needs to be done. They say it in reports. I'm sure that will be fed into the Food Systems Summit and the white paper, but how, how far apart are people, would you see Alvaro? Um, is there a meeting of minds, but not a meeting of action? Is there not a meeting of minds at all? How do we bring people together, Alvaro? Thank you very much. So um, perhaps on the operational side, I mean, our main experience, obviously, is through farm organizations, centers of research. So we have been somehow playing that role, and it's not an easy role in coordinating. With respect to the donors and your question, I would say when we talk about donors, obviously, you have many, a variety of donors. You have member states, you have private sector, you have civil society. So even if you think about member states, multilaterals, uh, institutions, their business models are also quite different. Um, some of the multilaterals have a lot of different sectors and agriculture sometimes it's less than 10% of their, of their own. When member states are talking about these uh, institutions, probably agriculture is not the, one of the primary um, focus and you have infrastructure, energy and others which are politically also more, more flashy. Um, the business models, if you think about the Rome based agencies and, and just on our coordination, speaking about ourselves, you have a mostly humanitarian agency, you have a normative agency, and you have ourselves, which are an implementing agency. Just coordinating these very different approaches, and even for ourselves, at least the member states is easier, but just the same member states here as in other multilateral institutions. Some come from the ministries of finance, the ministries of agriculture. So even at the national level, to be frank, when we discuss, there's also, as we know, difficulties with, between the different ministries and the financing and the policies. So it's not like it's an easy coordination matter and we all know it. However, um, with all the difficulties and the, and the challenges, we do have a hope that uh, putting together the Food System Summit Action Plan, the follow-up actions, as well as um, having the financing come together with that might be the ways as well as civil society to try to bring this together. Um, it's not easy and this we must recognize, but there's a, a lot of actors. I, I agree with many of my uh, colleagues on the political will and the need of the national pathways. And um, so, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Alvaro. I mean, there's a number of things 
that arise from that um, because consensus needs to be built. Um, the question is who is doing the consensus building? Of course, the GTPRD is doing that. I'm, I'm assuming that if are yourselves, obviously because of the unique way in which your constituent is trying to build consensus. Um, Andrew, are you seeing much consensus being built and how much um, more is required? Uh, thanks, Henry. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to try and shoot for uh, everyone agreeing on everything. So you need this, the middle part of the Venn diagram to be big enough that you can create a critical mass and do some really interesting things. But some of the real innovation comes from people at the edges who are on a different part of the curve uh, than others. And we need them to be out there stretching the boundaries. So, so yes, we need some consensus, but we don't need, uh, we need just enough. And that's why I made my point about needing skilled investment in skilled partnership brokering, because that enlarges the safe space, the comfortable space in the middle. Um, and that enables you to create a critical mass that may well take people outside their comfort zone but they trust the partnership. When I say people, I mean organisations, countries, uh, partners generally. But they trust the partnership and the social capital that's invested in it sufficient to say, well, I'm not comfortable here, but I'm going to go along with it because I'd be a lot more uncomfortable outside the collaboration uh, trying to tackle this stuff on our own. So you need just enough consensus, uh, but don't, uh, don't try and shoot the lights out. Oh, all right, I'm going to circle back on uh, let's go to Jim with this. Um, obviously, huge, huge, huge uh, donor, both multilaterally and bilaterally. Um, are you seeing enough consensus, or actually, are you happy for some of the uncomfortable outlier partnerships uh, to embrace those because maybe that's where innovation um, might come from, Jim? No, absolutely, that's true, Henry. Um, and let me say, in, in my current role um, with, with USAID and as the deputy coordinator for, for, for the US government to be the future, I, I've been involved in a number of multilateral um, uh, fora in preparation, both for the, the Food Systems Summit and build up the pre-summit that we had in, in, in Rome in, in July, and then the summit in a couple of weeks in New York, and also COP26 in November, and Nutrition for Growth in December. And as I've, I've actually been impressed with the amount of um, agreement around the big issues in terms of the urgency of the, the, the crisis, the, 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 the willingness of partners to get outside of the thinking of business as usual and, and being open to figuring out creative solutions on, on how we address the, 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 really the global challenge. I mean, it is, and these are general, this, this is the challenge of our generation, right? It, 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 climate change, um, uh, global global inequity and, and exclusion, um, and, and 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 of course right now we're fighting COVID. I mean those are the three big things. And when we look at the the food system summit, we look at um, COP twenty six, and we look at nutrition for growth, particularly those are real opportunities to bring everyone together. And and I think there's far more that brings us together than than separates us. So I think we're in, we're in pretty good shape there. I think Andrew's right. There's going to be things on the margins that we might um, haggle over, but that's to be expected, and that's fine. And what we we're going to, I actually am quite optimistic on, on how we're we are coalescing around some of these key issues on the on the need for systemic change. Uh huh. I, I've got a lot of. Uh, I'm going to stay with you, Jim, because I've got a lot of right. questions <laughs> coming in here, and, and other, other guy, my other panelists can can join in as well. So a number of people are talking about. Uh, policy about innovation and looking at things like land tenure, which they say is critical to produce he healthy food. We've got Christina who says, um, according to the speakers, how much securing land tenure contributes to fighting hunger and poverty and guaranteeing a sustainable food system? How much is this reflected in the develop development agenda? I'm going to link that question to the one I had in my mind about the current policy environment. Because obviously that's where some of the critical thinking comes when you get your policy and then the actions flow from that. Yep. 
I'm just wondering from a USAID, a USAID point of view, is that something that you look at when you're working with a country as a partnership and you're trying to work with the farmers on the ground? You've done a lot of work on the ground yourself, Jim. And when you yep. look at the farmers, you think to yourself, if this person, if this woman had tenure, she knew this was hers and no chief or traditional ruler could say, sorry, this is mine. You've got it for two, three years and I'm taking it back. How much of an impact would that would that have, you think? When it, and, and so I'm just, I'm just thinking about if you could talk about that and link it to the policy environment, because I think they're linked. Yeah, absolutely they're linked. And it, it, talking about ownership, right? We, we, we keep circling back to this key fundamental principle of what we're trying to get at um, and, and expand on in our work, right? So <laughs> I was four years in Zambia. And one of the things that we spent time on as a US government working with the, with the, the Zambian government was just trying to get the records in order of land ownership so that people, you know, again, if you're, if you're going to take out a loan, you have to show title, right? Often, you know, yeah. you usually need some kind of collateral and a title can serve as a great bit of collateral for a loan that allows you to expand your, your, your production. And so we work very closely with the, with the government of Zambia on working on the records and, and ensuring an easier process for people to register, to purchase re and, and um, transfer land titles because we recognize exactly what you're saying, Henry, which is it, it, that is a, a first step toward um, a agency for any individual family and community, and then uh, allows for a, a broader systemic change across the country. And it, it goes back to this point I was trying to make earlier, which is as a, a, a donor, when we're looking at partner countries, we wanna make sure that our, our host country is serious about the systemic change. We can't, we don't have the ability to affect the, the kinds of traditional land tenure issues that you're highlighting, right? But the host country does. Yes. And so we need to have open and honest conversations and say, look, I mean, we want to, we want to be partners with you. We want to follow your lead but you've got, you're going to have to address this fundamental issue, you know, whatever, and it's, it varies by country, right? And, and it varies by region. So you have to be flexible to how you, how you address it, but you need to stick to principles, which is what are you going to do, my, our host country partner, to step forward and make the kinds of policy changes that then we can support either with technical or financial support, whatever, whatever you're looking for to, to, to then allow a scale of that particular um, aspect of, of the change we want to see. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you, Jim. That's really good. It's a, it was an involved answer, but it was a good answer. So thank you very much indeed. And now we have Willem Oltholf from the European Commission who's raised his hand for a question. I think this is going to be a live question, is it? Willem, can you, are you able to join us? Um, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Many thanks, Henry, and, and uh, fascinating discussion. And um, obviously, um, yeah, a, a big issue is we all agree on how to, on the, on the fact that we need to transform food systems. And we also need to know that, that there are certain directions we have to go into. But, but um, food systems in their own right, they're, they're, they're an, an, uh, a holistic concept. They're difficult uh, to, to deal with. And um, what in, in the view of the panelists would be, let's say, essential entry points to, to trigger these, these, um, these changes in food systems? Um, and we, we heard some suggestions, but um, obviously um, there is an agenda to work on things holistically and to keep, uh, to keep work, people working together, multi-stakeholder, intersectoral, etc. Um, but sometimes you need specific entry points to trigger that. And um, Willem, do you have something in mind before I ask the panelists? Uh, look, I'm not going to give an answer to my own question. Uh, so oh, it's, uh, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course, I have things in mind uh, yes. because yeah, at, at the European Commission, we are also thinking about that, uh, that question. But I, I, it would also be interesting to hear it from others. Uh, Thanks. Okay, thank you. Let's go to, to Andrew, Andrew Campbell. Entry points, uh, maybe the soft underbelly, if I can uh, use a natural history analogy. Um, do you have one in mind? Uh, one or two entry points? Sure, Henry. Uh, 
we've just done an analysis of uh, food system resilience in the face of COVID across Southeast Asia and the Pacific Island countries. And one of the things that's come up in that analysis is the design of social protection measures, many of them in response to COVID. Uh, some of those social protection measures have been brilliant in supporting local food systems and food system resilience, and others have undermined food system resilience through not being designed so well. And so that is a, an entry point at the moment. We're finding that in some countries, agriculture's played a fantastic shock absorber role in the face of COVID, absorbing a lot of people with rapid movement of people away from the cities and back out to the countryside, giving them meaningful work to do and improving local food systems at the same time. So incentivizing those sorts of things that come up with sensible uh, changes to supply chains is a really good entry point right now because a lot of supply chains have been disrupted by travel restrictions and shipping problems and other things. So now's a really good time to get in and think about how we can, uh, uh, through existing social protection measures, if they're well designed, they actually boost the resilience of the system and benefit the poor, the landless, women, youth, uh, and so on in, in clever ways. So there's one. Thank you very much. Tremendous, Andrew. Thank you very much. I'm seeing a lot of activity in the chat uh, as opposed to the Q&A. Let's get some more questions, please. We've got a little bit more time. Uh, thank you, Jacques Conforti. He says, to be sustainable, food system transformation should translate in the reduction of inequalities locally and globally, you know, economic power, culture, etc. inequalities. And then Harriet says this, and she's talking a lot about policies this afternoon. I have noted the need for donors to align their funding agenda to national policies but also support given within the strategic plans of partners, which are in most cases to target the vulnerable groups. Thank you very much, Harriet. And then a question from Angus Keck. How supportive are donors of the rapid adoption of new technologies to solve critical smallholder farm challenges, farmer challenges, financing, landowning, transparency, such as digital currencies and tokens? Are donors likely to take a wait and see approach? That's interesting. How supportive are donors of the rapid adoption of new technologies. What do you think, Alvaro, I've not heard from you for a while. Any thoughts on that at all? Supportive of new technology, I suppose indeed taking risks. Thank you, Laura. I mean, we all talk also about technology and the need to, to use it, but when you go to the field and obviously you see farmers already um, and in some Sub-Saharan African countries, um, that's the technology they use their mobile phones, that's the technology that, that we can all refer to. There's also other drones that we also use, but I think um, the difficulty is how to scale that up because uh, clearly mobile phones, to a certain extent, you can have individual small farm folders. When we're talking about other types of technologies, they need a certain investment on capital, SMEs and so on. And that's where we have to go into the value chains and, and other matters. But clearly mobile banking has been one of the issues that we have been trying to support and uh, which has helped in many cases with the logistics, with the financing, with collateral, with the movement of cash. So I would say one of the clear uh, changes in the last decade has been uh, mobile technology. On top of that, there's obviously for small farm scale holders, I would say the main issue there is also obviously fixed capital, but uh, mobile phones clearly can be still used in many more ways. We ha do have projects that we also have projects with drones, with satellites, but I would perhaps emphasize the importance of mobile phones. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, the mo mobile phones were a game changer, I think, in many, in many, many areas. Uh, and Jim, hey, hey, about Henry, can I just answer real yes. quickly as well? Because yes. I, 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 I think that um, there is a there is a valid criticism. Uh, particularly for uh, folks to to donor countries are have being too risk averse, and, and and look let's let's be honest about why that is right. I mean, for, from where I sit, I'm using U United States taxpayer money, right, and I'm held accountable for those funds, and those people aren't giving them to me because they love me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there there is a very strong and 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 rightly. Um, uh, accountable system in place for donors, and that's across the board, right? And so we do have to be um, very conscious of the fact that, that we are spending other people's money, 
Um, and so that's, that's true. At the same time, there are opportunities that the current moment is providing us in terms of urgency um, that I think lends itself to letting us push, our, push beyond our comfort zone and, and take more risks. So to answer the question, our, you know, our, it, for instance, I could say, is, is the US government in, you know, in the Feed the Future program looking at trying to innovate and, and support and, and be more risk open to risk, then the answer is yes, we are. We're looking for creative solutions and we're trying to figure out what's possible. That's why we invest so much in research and innovation. Um, and it is, you know, it's the largest single piece of our portfolio is on research and innovation because we believe that that's, that, that's the long-term solution to trying to help um, smallholder farmers and other farmers um, get through um, this, this rapidly changing climate. So mm -hmm. I'll stop it. No, 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 that was good because it kind of links to uh, one of my kind of uh, closing questions as we come toward the end of this session. Um, so we're talking about research and innovation that forms a significant percentage of your, of your spend. Um, but what about capacity and knowledge? Because that's one of the things you hear about a lot, not just when it comes to agriculture, in, in other areas of development, but people talk a lot about capacity building and knowledge, scaling up. And then sometimes, I mean, I'm not a development specialist myself, but I've sometimes taken to you know, the ground to see what people are doing. And you see that often the kinds of capacity building you assumed was being done, it's not reaching people. It's not deep enough, it's not wide enough. And I'm like, this is me thinking, why is this still happening? Surely, I mean, the USAID or um, the Australian government, the Italian government, if I has been working in this area for generations, why are people still doing things this way? Why is there no capacity? I mean, before I ask uh, our colleagues, Jim, any thoughts on that? Capacity and knowledge not being scaled up enough sometimes. And I'm just wondering. Well, well, Henry, that's one of the buzzwords that I, my staff knows I hate. Oh, because right. Usually, okay. When somebody says capacity building, it means yeah. so many things to so many people, right? And okay. so what, what, the one thing that I can't stand is when I find out that any kind of project or program that we're supporting is doing capacity building, which really turns out to be, you know, one week of training in a, a five-star hotel in the capital city of, you know, f fill in the blank, whatever the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, when capacity building, when we talk about it, it needs to be grounded in real the, the, the real needs of the host country. They need to be asking for it. They need to say, here's what we need to get done. Let's let's take, for instance, um, your, the earlier question on technology and, 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 and innovation. Let's work. Let's think about a, a, a research extension organization in, a, in any given country. Those folks, if they're looking for capacity, they want to figure out how to, you know, how to take their knowledge and, and speak to local farmers. So how do you do that? You're not going to do that in a hotel. You're going to do that by having experts working with them in the field and, you know, doing, do, learning by doing, right? That's how you do um, strong capacity building. And so I'm but, but that forces us, again, outside of our comfort zone. That's a lot harder to do. It takes more, you know, it takes, frankly, more money. And, and but you need to then follow the lead of your host country and listening to exactly what it is they're looking for and then figure out a, a learning by doing method that actually helps the, um, the individuals, uh, the institutions um, at, at, in question um, upgrade their skills. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. I won't mention the C, B word again. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Andrew, um, uh, you, you want to say something? Yes. Okay. You want to. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Henry. Well, bring those last two points together. Again, because of COVID, we're not seeing as much travel. We're seeing fantastic uh, um, performance from our alumni. So people who have had their capacity built. Uh, <laughs> Are stepping up and leading in ways that we just haven't seen before. So, you know, we've got a thousand odd people across our, our partner countries that have done PhDs or masters training and so on. That they're stepping up and running the show now. It's fantastic. Um, coming back to the digital question, a lot of people think digital of drones and robots and so on. Um, it may be true, as the questioner says, that donors will take a wait and see approach on digital currencies, but certainly not on uh, digital financing tools 
uh, digital extension tools, even in 2G environments. I've, I've been in northern Myanmar where each farmer's got two, two phones in their hand and you can, you can deliver services through those phones that are associated with their purchase of inputs that comes with extension advice and so on mm. with integrated approaches through a, a digital technology. And if you link that to insurance or uh, other forms of securitization, which again links back to the land tenure question, but the digital solutions are, there's a huge scope for innovation. And this brings in the private sector partners on the value chain. Yes. And this is also a way of keeping young, talented people in agriculture, because they've got no desire to be on the end of a hoe, but they're very happy designing an app or designing some software and working in that sort of environment. So we think there's enormous scope in this area. And so certainly as a donor, we're not waiting to see what happens, we're wanting to roll up our sleeves and get involved in that area. Very good. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Um, lots more questions coming in. We've got just five more minutes before we launch the new GDPRD stock taking report. So do stay with us for that. Uh, Flor Prado has asked this question. Um, if we agree on the need to unravel the challenges of the food system in a holistic way, how can donors change the timing of their funds considering long-term results. I suppose timing, you often hear from uh, recipient ministries, they're constantly worried about the, the timeline and the uh, point at which donors will um, release the funds and how they can plan in a two to three year cycle, whether it's the agriculture ministry or any other ministry. Um, Alvaro, what do you think about that? Donors and timing, and I suppose it's aligning the timing of funds with that of the partner country. Well, I, I, from your, I mean, from your description, I'm not as concerned on the timing. I think the timing generally and the projects, at least in our case, are very clear. There are seven year eight projects. We are there for the medium long term, the disbursements and are, are clear. Um, I wanted perhaps to answer, um, if I may, on the capacity yes. building, because I think it's quite important. I mean, we do have, as an example, a lot of um, business entrepreneurs and trying to also teach them through farmers organizations. However, in our case, we provide loans and grants. What we see is that in terms of grants, that capacity building is always welcome. In terms of borrowing for capacity building, learning, it's not always as simple to have governments put it as one of the priorities. That's the reality. I mean, there's obviously other things that are more tangible and easier to justify. So that's one of the issues, the difficulty of finding, given the importance that that also way of being able to mobilize the funds to generate that uh, uh, training uh, of the people in the ground, especially. Um, thank you. Tremendous. And uh, Laura Lorenzo has a question. Um, I mean, she's enjoying the discussion. She's at the World Rural Forum and uh, convinced on the enormous potential of family farmers to contribute to revamp rural economies, to attract young people in agriculture, reduce vulnerabilities and inequalities to build resilience and sustainable livelihoods. And then she asks, and this might be for you, Andrew, although you sort of answered it when you said young people don't want to be on the end of a hoe, but they do want to be designing an app. And she asks, what in your point of view are the key elements in unleashing this potential? Do you feel you've answered that or do you have anything further to say on that? Not much, Henry. Yes, so the digital agenda is very good, but the, the crucial ingredients is that the old people have to get out of the road and let them have a go. Okay, uh, tremendous. Now, while you're there, um, I suppose closing question, um, what would you like to see, what message would you like to go forward from here to the Food Systems Summit, which is almost upon us, and of course, the white paper? Is there something, I mean, we've talked about a lot of, about a lot of things in the last hour and a half or so. I'm going to try and distill it, and we must do that. But what would your message, your distilled message be as we go forward to that Food Systems Summit and indeed the white paper? Did you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, you did you hear yeah. this, Andrew? I think it was meant for Andrew initially, but that's fine. Oh, okay. Well, my two, Henry, would be innovation. We, uh, I don't want to use the words that Matt Damon used in the in the film The Martian, but we're going to have to science this thing at a level that we've never done before. Uh, and the next one is 
In order to do that, we're going to need better, deeper, wider partnerships and very skilled brokering of those partnerships up and down and sideways and from the smallest farmer to the biggest multinational. Uh, and that's going to require investment in those skills and the people and the time to do it. But that will be a very high return on investment. Very good. Well, I like that. And you're forgiven for using the Matt Damon reference because I'm a fan. So that's good. OK, tremendous. Thank you, Andrew. Um, let's see. Avad, I'll go to you and then I'll conclude with Jim there. So um, the message that should go forward from here and not forgetting that this has to be sustainable, because as a number of you have said, we cannot continue to do the things we've done thus far. I mean, we love our beautiful blue planet, but we're at war with it. Avaro. Thank you very much for your words, Henry. Um, so I think donors will need, I mean, if the message is mostly to donors and the follow-up on the food system. So I would encourage them to look much more at the synergies across the entire food system in terms of livelihoods, of nutrition, environment. And to me, this will involve probably working in a much more integrated way in the traditional silos, I would say, of agriculture, health, environment, economic development, infrastructure, trade. So this is uh, needs to bring a lot of different actors and a lot of different uh, now silos together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alvaro. And then, Jim, concluding with you, um, the message that must go forward from here, given the wider discussions. I mean, COP26 is what, in, in November? And no. that is, and I will say it's the elephant, the very large climatic elephant in, in this room. Yep. Uh, thanks first. Thanks for organizing this event. Uh, you know, this has helped, um, certainly helped me, and I, and I loved hearing fellow panelists, th hearing their, their collective wisdom and vision on the, the role the, our, our, our community can play in, in transforming food systems. I, I've already picked up quite a bit and in, in inspired. Um, look, U.S. government's going to invest heavily in this. We're in the Food System Summit. We're going to roll out some big commitments in, in, in a couple of weeks as, as part of the summit through our Feed the Future program. But as I mentioned, Henry, in the opening, um, we've, we need to focus on how the outcomes to the, the summit can be embraced by the field and integrated into our, all of the, the things that we do. And I, I love Gert just tell, pushing us to stop thinking about projects and programs, but thinking about aligning with the host governments and, and making that channeling our resources in ways that are probably going to be a little uncomfortable for us, but that allow for promoting locally owned development that reaches across sectors and incorporates them into everything we do. So, um, and, and of course I would just reiterate, I agreed with Andrew and Navarro on those the points they made. So I think Great, I'll stop. Thanks, brilliant, Jim. Thanks uh, for talking to us on behalf of USAID and Alvaro on behalf of IFAD and well, Carlo Montesi, uh, we lost, and Gerda Verberg, we lost earlier. They had to go on Giorgio Marapodi. But we did hear from them a little bit at the beginning. Um, sadly, Martin Boila uh, from CADAP wasn't able to join us. But Andrew, you were there as well, a stalwart, Andrew Campbell. Um, so, uh, tremendous. So, that concludes our main kind of high-level panel discussion. It's now time for the launch of the GP, GDPRD's stock-taking report, which has been done to prepare for and to follow up from the Food Systems Summit. And it, uh, if you're not aware, it's actually on the donors' contribution to food systems. And in this final session, we're going to hear initially from Jim Woodhill, who's Director of Agri-Food Nexus Consulting and Honorary Research Associate at the Environmental Change Institute, University of Oxford, who's fed in hugely into this. And then we'll hear from the co-chairs of the GDPRD, Tristan Armstrong, who met at the beginning, and Conrad Ryan, who's waiting in the wings, as you can see Conrad there. And you'll also be able to send in your thoughts and questions. Continue to send those in via the chat box or through the Q&A box so we can see it more directly. So that's gonna be the final half hour of this session. Um, but for now, let me uh, hand over to Jim, who's been listening quietly. Over to you, Jim Woodhill. Fantastic. Thank you, Henry. I think you can uh, hear me okay. Absolutely. Yes. Loud and clear. And beautifully framed with that. all those books in the background. Tremendous. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thanks so much to our panellists and, and to Jemima. A very, very interesting discussion that I think really feeds into the work that the Global Donor Platform will be doing uh, going ahead from the, from the Food Systems Summit. Let me just uh, share my screen here.
Right, I think that should be working, correct, Henry? Y y yes, very much indeed. I can see everything. Okay. Wonderful. Well, look, what, what I'd like to do is, um, as briefly as I can, just give a little bit of an overview of what is in the stock taking report. And you'll discover that it aligns very nicely with a lot of the comments that have already been made this morning. So I can probably skip over some of the things that uh, I was intending to, to say. Um, so firstly, just a little background of this. This was really a way of the uh, global donor platform engaging in the Food Systems Summit and setting a, a context in terms of mapping out how donors are currently contributing to food systems. Um, also recognizing that perhaps not all stakeholders involved in the Food Systems Summit recognize the sort of roles and functions that donors play. So making that more available and also creating a basis or a foundation from which to move ahead in thinking about how donors may want to shift and change what they're doing in relation to the outcomes of the Food Systems Summit. Um, in doing a report, we drew on uh, information from the uh, DAC um, data. We had interviews with uh, most of the donors in the platform. We did a fairly solid review of donor websites and reviewed a whole bunch of recent reports. Um, I guess the starting point really was taking this food systems perspective and perhaps just to emphasize that this is much more than just the latest bit of jargon um, and much more than just semantics. I think as we've heard very strongly already today, it really signals the need for a much more integrated approach uh, to how we're tackling issues of health, climate, the environment, poverty, um, gender issues, uh, and, and a whole much longer list of, of really critical factors that are going to affect the achievement of the SDGs. It also signals the need to put more emphasis on the consumption end of what's happening and in the midstream from farmers fields to uh, consumers fork and all of the work and all the M M MS uh, small and medium scale enterprises that happens in that space. It gives us more attention about some of the trade offs across the food system and importantly a food systems perspective. Uh, brings attention that what happens in all countries is very interconnected. So I think it helps to link some of the issues around poverty and rural development into a much bigger global agenda that I think is also very uh, important in terms of how we can tackle some of the issues affecting the most vulnerable and the most poor people in the world. Um, in our discussions with donors, they sort of noted that uh, many of them are adopting and integrating a much more food systems thinking into their work, but also recognising that it's perhaps early days, particularly in trying to get this sort of integration working in programs at a country level. And we've heard about some of the challenges of achieving coordination there. It's also perhaps worth uh, noting that there is still a very significant data gap in terms of being able to take an overall food systems perspective. Um, in terms of some of the data I'll present in a moment, we used a whole lot of DAC areas and codes and they're listed on the right there, I won't go through them, but particularly linking in the food security and emergency food aid issues with the investments in agriculture. In talking with donors and looking at what's going on, we identified seven key areas of donor contribution. Of course, the huge amount of work that's going on in supporting country programs and projects, the overall support for UN organisations, the food systems governance platforms and networks, whether it's a CFS, whether it's regional platforms or even national platforms, a lot of work happening through NGOs and civil society, the critical area of research and innovation that has been talked about quite extensively this morning, of course, the critical area of finance and mobilizing finances, and finally, the private sector and market development. So these were the seven areas where we identified that donors make a, a significant contribution to food systems. Just a few uh, snapshots of some of the data that's in the report. We've already heard this morning about how food systems represents about an 8% of ODA contribution. In absolute terms, that's gone up over the last few years, but its percentage um, in terms of uh, ODA hasn't changed over a, a decade. Um, perhaps more interestingly, it's uh, worth looking at what's changing with agriculture. So absolute amounts of funding for agriculture have increased but as a percentage, it hasn't gone up. In fact, it's dropped slightly. But as you can see in this graph, quite significantly, emergency food aid has gone up quite dramatically um, over the last decade, which I think sends a, an important signal and that relates to some of the issues that have been talked about this morning. Um, if you want to look into the report, you can see how the funding flows through recipient governments, but also to emphasize that a significant amount of money does actually flow through donors 
and the private sector. In doing this work, we looked at uh, the investment profiles of a whole lot of different donors. And I think this is interesting in terms of looking at where donors can be collaborative and recognizing that there is a significant diversity in approach, thematic focus and geographic focus. So you'll find this information, particularly in the annex to the report. Um, you'll also find in the report ODO flows by donor and recipient region, and I won't spend any time on, on this, but it's there in the report to look at. In terms of the scale and breadth of funding, I mean, if we recognise that the global food system is worth some 10 trillion or more, of course, 8% of ODA is a relatively small amount, which comes back to the discussions we've been having today about the need for much more catalytic approaches to raising finances. We also saw, though, that there's a vast range of initiatives being supported. We've heard the discussion about you know, 13,000 different activities supported by donors of less than that 0.5 million. If you look at everything that's been funded, it's an interesting question about whether there are really any big gaps or whether there's actually a fairly broad spread of what's being funded. But clearly additional resources are needed to achieve SDG2, as we've heard this morning. And there's a question, I guess, around a sort of balance in the best use of these finances. And of course, this raises all the questions about how to best align with the Food System Summit outcomes. We also looked at some 40 different reports, some 840 different recommendations. And I guess the point here is that much of what needs to be done is relatively well known. The big challenge is how do you bring that about? How do you go about getting these sort of recommendations implemented? And we will be developing a database of these recommendations that will be available on the Global Donor Platform website. So let me just uh, close off here with uh, four key messages. And I guess this will be reiterating and emphasizing quite a lot we've already heard this morning. I think the first one is that overseas development assistance underpins the overall global response capability to food systems issues, whether it's bringing people across cultures and countries to talk about the issues, whether it's the work of the CFS at a global level, um, whether it's the integrated research and coordination that happens through the CGIR. And many of these benefits um, have a significant global benefit, not just for countries with uh, uh, well, developing countries or low and middle income countries, which is the focus of donors. So I think accepting and recognizing the much greater global benefit. A lot of what donors invest in has a big influence on the overall governance structure for food systems response. And there's a big question here about whether that architecture is right for the 21st century. We've talked a lot today about the importance of coordination and a food systems approach makes that even more important, but uh, perhaps worryingly, we do see this trend towards perhaps more bilateral aid, these large numbers of small country level projects. Oh, sorry, not sure what's happened there. Um, but there is, if you look at this, much opportunity for greater coordination in all sorts of ways, in bringing countries together at the, or bringing donors together at the country level and led by in-country processes, by linking across researchers, by the engagement with private sector. So there's really no shortage of opportunities for how that coordination could, in many ways, quite easily be uh, strengthened. And I think Andrew has mentioned the importance of sort of brokering partnerships to help that happen. Enhancing food systems resilience will obviously be very, very critical in response to climate change, but we've also seen how critical that is in response to COVID. Um, so how do we uh, shift this uh, increasing um, level of uh, emergency food aid and put in place some of the deeper structures and changes that can actually mean that we build a resilience rather than actually having to invest in uh, or fund uh, a response to crises? Um, Food obviously is the number one priority in any crisis situation and tackling uh, this and building resilience obviously requires a food systems approach that integrates with a whole range of broader uh, development goals. And so finally, just to the main other main point out of the report is the issue around catalyzing systemic change. Um, how can donor support to tackle the underlying structural constraints? to change, whether that's the broader sort of societal understanding around food systems, whether it's the way subsidies are used, whether it's the way that uh, technology is driven and able to support those who most need to access it. How can donor funding be most catalytic in terms of driving other investment that is 
um, inclusive, sustainable, uh, responsible. Um, and perhaps a point that's that's come up perhaps uh, tangentially is how can donor in in interventions make sure that they align with how complex systems uh, operate, that things don't always work in a straightforward linear way. So how can you build in the flexibility uh, to make sure donor funding is responsive and adaptive? Um, integration, integrating technical and policy solutions. And finally, what's the focus that's needed on getting the right processes of change and bringing people together at the local level, at the national level, at the global level to actually drive all the sorts of things that have been talked about today and recognising in the end that it's people that make the difference, it's the relationships between people and organisations that are going to drive all of this. So what is this process of change that perhaps needs more attention around the idea of catalyzing systemic change? So let me leave it there for um, reactions from our global donor platform co-chairs or to answer any questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much, Henry. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Jim. Tremendous. I mean, that's quite a piece of work, <laughs> but I mean, it's been very important in the, as far as stock taking is concerned, because we've talked a lot with our panelists and our participants. We've had an awful lot of um, engagement, which is, which is tremendous. But at the same time, it was very, very important, I think, to feed all of that in, let it percolate, and then actually say, where are we at the moment? You know, how does this relate to what is actually being done right now? So I'm delighted to bring in the co-chairs of the GDPRD, Tristan Armstrong and Conrad Rhein, and uh, they're going to respond to what you've just uh, given us, uh, Jim. And also I invite uh, people, as you just did, uh, our delegates, we've still got a good number of people on the platform now to uh, pop in their questions in the Q&A box or reflections in the chat box, because we've got a, a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, for, for real change here, and we've got to use it and feed it into the Food System Summit and the white paper. So let's, let's do that now. But now for now, let me hand over to Tristan and Conrad. Thanks. Thanks very much, Henry, and thanks, Jim. Um, look, that was a really speedy but comprehensive overview of a pretty fascinating uh, bit of analysis. Uh, it's pretty rich, um, and and I think you know will really contribute to uh, donor dialogues. You know, now going through the Food System Summit and, and obviously developing that white paper uh, in the wake of the summit, and really building on some of the fantastic ideas that we've heard in tonight's event or today's event for, for most of you um, uh, to help us reimagine uh, you know how we can work better uh, to drive more systemic change uh, and and I think you know there's a there's, there's obviously been you know a really broad uh, there's a really broad suite of ideas suite of ideas there are many of which you touch on in the report and and also some really startling figures I mean I, I do feel that overall while we as donors clearly recognize the key issues and we recognize we need um, you know to address those issues we know we know the what but we're just not much good at the how uh, and, and and you know as you point out and, and I've looked in, in more detail obviously at, at some of those figures and I really encourage other people listening online to have a look at some of those uh, those um, visuals that, that are in the report, they're pretty powerful. Um, and, and, and I do think without sort of substantial change, we will continue to drift rather aimlessly and incoherently, uh, you know, away from achieving our, our targets from, from a human development and an environmental perspective. And, and really to, to being able to respond to climate change through, uh, you know, through, through the use of, of, of aid support, of uh, development support. You know, and, and I think that the report really highlights that, you know, there's been a, a worrying lack of global ambition. I think 8% of, of ODA is, is a pretty small number for a sector which touches a vast area of the planet and which, which actually interacts with some of the poorest um, and most underprivileged people. Uh, and, you know, people on, on, on whom, you know, we all, uh, we all rely as, as food producers. Uh, you know, and, and I think that the, the, obviously the, the key point for me in, in, in that presentation was just the great proliferation of small, disconnected, small value projects, uh, which, which, you know, I think obviously speak great volumes. And I think Perda and, and other people mentioned this in the, in the plenary. Uh, you know, these are driven by our own, uh, our own uh, uh, drivers. 
uh, as donors and, and, and not really the, the, uh, uh, the genuine uh, and, and, and comprehensive uh, um, uh, kind of uh, desire to actually assist. Um, so we, need, we obviously need a great deal more harmonization. Uh, uh, and, and but the issue is, is how obviously and, and, and thanks for all the, the, the folks around the table tonight who've, who've really um, helped us move that forward. You know, the, I guess uh, the other real key takeaway from me, Jim, is just the rise in emergency response uh, funding. And I think that that, that really tells a, a really worrying picture. That trend is, is consistent over a decade. Uh, we are seeing it where we are. Uh, it, it, it reflects a collective failure Right to do to do more, not just to spend more, but to do more uh, to, to assist um, uh, you know the the, uh, the food system of the world transform. And I think it really should be a wake up call. Uh, on a positive on the positive side, I guess the report highlights that donors have you know a unique mandate and responsibility and and and, and you know, for shaping and influencing the way things go, and and that we we care and and, we, and we're doing this. You know we're, we're we're meeting in forums like this. We're discussing stuff. We're, we're taking that and we're trying to make it happen uh, through, through our, um, our, our initiatives and through our collaborations. You know, the ideas we embrace, the policies we implement, you know, they're critical for shifting the, the, the food system. And, and other actors, you know, they'll, they'll look to us um, for direction, they'll look to us for leadership. And, and they'll particularly do that when we're, when we're working together and we're, we're proudly working together. I think that that, that is a, a really key point. Um, you know, and we do need to support those people in other sectors and, and, other, and other parts of, of the food system, you know, to, to strengthen the enabling environments, to reduce the risks faced by, by, by people who can often not afford to take big risks as we transition those food systems. Um, farmers who can't borrow, uh, farmers who, you know, will have to change what they do and are fearful, quite rightly, um, about change. Uh, you know, how do we, you know, in, empower investors to adopt new ideas and technologies and, and, and drive that empowerment through, really importantly, uh, you know, to, to, to women in, in the food system, because without that, we just won't succeed. Uh, I mean, I wrote a few other little notes as you were speaking. I don't want to take too much time. I realise we've only got a few minutes left, but I think that, um, you know, we need to we need to resource harmonization. I think that's a key point that came out a number of times today. And you know that harmonization is difficult. It's, it's transactional, it requires effort, it requires commitment. But we have to balance that against the enormous potential cost of not cooperating effectively. I mean, if we fail to do more now, our future budgets will be completely overwhelmed by emergency response expenditure. You know? and, and you know, we can't allow that to happen. We've got to, we've got to do more now. So um, you know, I guess uh, that's that's prob they're probably my, my key points. Um, you know, obviously stronger collaboration uh, and, and providing people with you know really understanding the risks, providing people with real options that, that they can take forward, and doing that in a way that 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 uh, um, that plays to, to to country level priorities and to community level priorities, and not just to donor priorities. So I think the paper is great. It covers a lot of important ground. It's incredibly timely as we consider ideas to take forward. Um, and I really want to thank you, Jim, for the really hard work that you've done, um, and and the really valuable contribution that you've made to this debate. Over. Over. <laughs> And Jim, that's a nice hero gram for you, as we say in this part of the world. But Con I can see Conrad looking at me, smiling. And Conrad, I want to hear from you, from uh, you, your point of view. You're co-chair alongside Tristan. And um, you wear a different hat, of course, a EU hat. But um, yeah, your thoughts, please, on this big piece of work that Jim and his team has done, the stock taking. Indeed, a huge piece of work. And many thanks, Jim, for that excellent presentation. And thanks a lot to Tristan for sharing his insights. This uh, stock taking report goes far beyond an overview and analysis of donor investment in food systems. In fact, it very clearly illustrates how central food is both to poverty and many other development issues. And it thoughtfully covers the concept of food systems from the production to the consumption of food. And this report will serve as a good basis for the work of the donor community, United Food and GDBRD, in responding to the outcomes of the food system side. I would like to highlight a few particular issues. Let me start with coordination. 
Donor coordination is absolutely crucial to catalyze systemic change and needs to be stepped up. I think we heard, heard this very clearly today. My vision is to strengthen alignment of programming and funding through the deliberations facilitated by the GDBRB. And this global coordination, which should also involve the partner countries, and we heard that aspect several times as well today during the panel, will help to achieve greater and more targeted effectiveness, which is particularly critical at the country. Allow me to elaborate a bit more on the role of the platform in all of this. This week, with the organization of two very relevant events in the run up to the Food Systems Summit, the platform has clearly demonstrated its convening power. I would like to recall that at the GDBRD board meeting about a year ago, Agnes Kalibata highlighted that the Food Systems Summit should be not just another meeting, but rather a turning point with not only noble commitments, but rather real action as its follow up. Donors will need to have a response to the outcomes of the summit, and the GDRD is very ready to help to align views across the donor community. I refer to catalyzing systemic change, which involves several interrelated areas, such as the de-risking of finance, investment in research and innovation, engagement with the private sector, and promotion of enhanced resilience mechanisms. And again, coordination is crucial in all of these areas. Therefore, concluding in times of shrinking public budgets, combined with the need for donors to target investments in a world far from ideal, with environments on the ground as complex and different as they can possibly be, there is a strong role and huge need for the GDBRD. More now than ever before. Thanks a lot. Over to you, Henry. Thank you very much indeed, Conrad. So, uh, Jim, you've heard what the two co-chairs have had to say about um, your piece of work. Let me hear what you make of their responses. And also, I suppose, a, a thought on what we've heard today. And, if, is, and is it pushing us closer to where we need to be for the Food Systems Summit? Yeah, thanks, Henry. Yeah. Look, I think the discussion today has been very encouraging in recognition of the sort of challenges and the issues that need to be addressed. The, the need to think more about systemic change, I think, has been a, a you know, very critical discussion today. We need to go a bit deeper in how that actually gets implemented. And I think the growing commitment we've heard about the need for, uh, for coordination also becomes important. But again, that has to go beyond just the words. We have to actually get the processes right at the local and the country level for that to happen. And of course, the UN agencies have a very critical role to play at that at the country level. Um, but I think, you know, really investing in those processes at that level and investing in the sort of brokering uh, needs to needs to go forward. So I think, you know, sometimes there's a temptation to just invest in the, the hard parts of donor investment, perhaps not invest enough in some of the processes that put the oil in the wheels to make it all work together. So I think some sort of thinking about that right of balancing is needed. And I think we then look forward to moving on to developing the white paper that's been discussed, which will try and flesh out in further detail some of the issues that have been raised here in close consultation with all of the donors and all of those that have been involved in the, in the Food System Summit. So I think we sort of look forward to, to taking that piece of work forward. And perhaps also just to mention that the donor platform has developed a declaration of intent, which will cover a number of these issues and which will also be launched uh, prior to the to the summit. And uh, just before I stop there, let me also just please acknowledge the, the great support and work from our Crystal Jones and Sylvia Tenio, who also worked on developing this report uh, with quite quite a number of nights uh, effort as well. So thanks. Thanks to them. Excellent. But let's close with our co-chairs just finally. Um, Tristan and Conrad, you can take this in whichever order you want. So what happens between now and the Food System Summit, which is looming large? What happens now, Tristan? Thanks. Um, thanks, Henry. Look, I think, um, you know, we'll need to, to, to really absorb um, what we've heard today um, and, and think about, you know, a, a sensible path, pathway forward in terms of taking, distilling the key ideas and, and taking them up through our membership to, uh, uh, to, 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 to the dialogues that are going on um, uh, at, the, at the summit and beyond. I mean, I personally think that it's really what happens after the summit that's going to count. The summit will be over in, in, a, in a couple of hours. Sadly, it's going to be a virtual event. 
Um, it's hard to get too excited about that. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's, it's, the, it's these sorts of conversations that I think are the real drivers of change. Uh, we'll hear from our leaders uh, and they'll say some, you know, uh, some, some sage, they'll have some sage thoughts. Um, but, it, but it's these working level discussions uh, that, that, that really um, are the ones that are, are going to shift um, the system. And so I would really encourage those of you online, those of you who've joined, uh, to stay engaged, uh, to keep track of our website. We'll send updates to you in terms of next steps for the development of the white paper. We'd like as many of you to be involved in that process as possible. And we'd certainly like <coughs> to, to, to ask you what you how you would like to engage with us on that. You know, would you like another event like this or similar to this, where we take you through uh, and, you know, where we've gone since this conversation and, and, and you know, what we've learned through the summit uh, and seek your feedback on that. You know, a document should be live uh, and, and it should be about people coming together and exchanging ideas in a, in a you know, in a, in a, in a constructive and, 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 um, and, and, you know, and, and dynamic way. So, um, you know, I, th that's, that's the whole point of this platform. You know, it's not to keep still, it's to move. Uh, and so, uh, so we want to we wanna engage you in that process um, and, and following the white paper on, on how we can help you um, take some key messages back to your executives, uh, back to your organisations, and get them, hopefully, to start seeing things slightly differently. Okay. Final word to you, Conrad. No, I mean, time is up, but thanks a lot to the Secretariat, to Tristan, to Henry, to everybody for making this possible. I think it has been a huge success, and now... Uh, the ball is in our hand, and as Tristan rightly said, we will be engaged and you can count on us and there will be a lot of follow-up. So thanks a lot and a nice afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody <laughs> who participated. Bye. Excellent. Thank you very much, Conrad. Thank you very much, Tristan. Thank you very much, Jim. To all our panellists, to Jemima and Yuki um, for setting us off so brilliantly at the beginning of our session. For, to all the team, Maurizio and all the team behind the scenes, Michelle, who's there in the chat box, encouraging you to continue the dialogue, as Tristan said. And uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. Delighted that there was so much thinking and discussing and so much to take away. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye.